Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. I'm Hazel. Uh, we're two people who studied archaeology together and love history. Um, so what have you been doing craft-wise this week? I have branched out into gardening. Oh. But, um, no branches actually involved. I, I planted my woad at the weekend. Uh, it turns out digging is actually quite tiring. Um, who knew? Hazel, you did archaeology. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I kind of... I haven't excavated in a while. <laughs> is is it the digging properly down rather than scraping back layers that does it? Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I've done my fair share of mattocking, but I was a bit useless at that as well, to be honest. But I, I did it. I dug myself a bed for the wood uh, plant. Um, and it should be ready in July. It should be fully grown. So we're going to see some beautiful blue dyed wool on the, really on the, so. it in the summer yeah i'll do some videos um because woad is like when you dye with woad it looks gray in the pot and then you pick it out and it turns blue with oxidate oxidization it's like oh it's, that's very cool yeah that, so is, really that is actual witchcraft i know <laughs> it kind of makes you understand why woad is associated with like magic and things mm. yeah, it's very cool um so yeah hopefully all I, all I need to do is um make it not die within the next so that it can die yes but constructively <laughs> uh what have you been up to um i have been coping with anxiety by making salted caramel brownies that is an extremely valid coping mechanism. Um, yeah, like all you all you have to do is you you put the brownie batter in the pan, mm. you put on just some blobs of salted caramel on top, and you just kind of swirl it through with oh a God. chopstick, and you get these beautiful like feathery patterns of caramel. And then when you bake it, they all like crisp up and and like melt into the brownies. It's it's so good. It's so good. Oh, I can see them. I can taste them. <laughs> Why would you do this to me? <laughs> when we are no longer on lockdown, we'll <laughs> produce some brownies. Yes! <laughs> I look forward to being on the receiving end of production. Um, on the receiving end of some brownies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you put it like that, it sounds a bit aggressive, doesn't it? I'll just get a trebuchet and just launch them to Sussex. It'll be fine. Mm. Have we talked about this before? I feel like this is a strategy we've done before. Possibly. But on the other hand, I really like siege weaponry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a point you've got there. I cannot yeah. deny. Um, I I'll do it for science. So, <laughs> I believe this is another episode that was suggested by a listener. Was yeah. Um, I'm terrible, and I've, I've forgotten who it was. Who was it? Um, Andy on Twitter. Yeah, thanks, Andy, because I really like sheep, and now I get to talk about it to the internet. I am very excited to learn all there is to know about heritage sheep breeds. Okay. Uh, well, it turns out there's a lot of breeds of sheep. What? So, <laughs> they're, they're quite a popular animal, so <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about all of the sheep breeds. Um but I've sort of picked out some of the more interesting ones to mention. Um, so sheep have been domesticated for, for quite a long time, but they weren't used for wool, um, I think, until I thought to have been domesticated um, between 11,000 and 8,000 BC. Is this our friend the Fertile Crescent? It is! It's Mesopotamia! Heck yeah. 
yeah, everyone loves the Levant. We can say heck, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Nice. Fine. Probably. So, but at that time, they were kept for their meat and for their milk and their pelts as well. They didn't really begin to be used for wool until the Bronze Age, um, or the Bronze Age in Europe, anyway. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to keep this probably more European, British focused, because I don't have a huge amount of knowledge about wool specifically outside of that region. Um, I mean, I feel like if we covered every breed of sheep from yeah. all of the countries, <laughs> this might take a while. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and the ancient breed of sheep was a lot smaller than it is today. And the coat was less big and fluffy um, and probably coarser. But with selective bleed breeding over the centuries, they've got a lot more um, diversified in terms of the breeds. And some of them are really specialized for their wool. Um, so originally, they probably would, wouldn't have been shorn. They would just like sheep molt their, fur, their wool naturally um yeah because you can least... pick it off like fences and fields can't you yeah yeah um and at least the more ancient breeds um would have done this modern breeds do need to be sheared because otherwise their wool doesn't come off but um... have you seen shrek the sheep i have is that the one that escaped for like six years yeah i will post I will find something about Shrek the Sheep and I will put it in the show notes so that everyone can enjoy Please. the glory. It will bring joy to your day. It really will. <laughs> <laughs> so um, originally people would have just sort of picked up the wool that was caught on things and on the ground that had fallen off and just kind of gone like, ah, oh, this is warm. We can make a thing from it. And then they did that. Uh, and the rest is history as they say. Um, So one of the breeds of sheep heritage breeds that I kind of found out about as a result of this is the Caracal breed. And these originate from Central Asia and they're probably one of the closest breeds to like an ancient style breed of sheep that exists today. Um, That you can see like carvings of them in Babylonian temples and their kind of wool has been found in like ancient Persia. So they're, they are like a really old breed of sheep. Um, and they've been imported to Africa and to the USA as well. Um, so they're mainly used for uh, meat and for their pelts as well, for the sheepskins. Uh, but their wool is also used, it makes really, really good, strong carpet wool. So I'm guessing that most of the like amazing Persian carpets and stuff are made with this kind of wool. Um, and apparently the craft of felting evolved with this wool. This was like the first wool to be felted, which oh, that's is cool. interesting. Yeah. I've not done any felting. Have you? No, I I want to, but the sound that the needles make, the horrible like crunching tearing noise just it goes right through me oh, man is that like needle felting yeah yeah the stabby one yeah I, is there a non-stabby one yeah there's wet felting which is literally where you oh like medieval hats on top of each other and get it wet and like rub it okay i might be able to do that one okay yeah i mean it's yeah less murderous Mm. Hmm. do you want to hear about some icelandic sheep i absolutely want to hear about some icelandic sheep oh they're so good i'm gonna find a picture of an icelandic sheep and i'm gonna post it to the twitter because they're incredible um they are also another very very ancient breed in fact the icelandic sheep of today is genetically the same as it was 1100 years ago and that is because it is illegal to import sheep into Iceland. Wait, what? <laughs> I love how we keep discovering these really weird niche laws. I know. 
it is illegal to import sheep into Iceland in case they crossbreed with the protected heritage Icelandic sheep and and deteriorate the breed. Um, yeah, the more you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, so these, and I think it's because these, they are quite a special breed. They're direct descendants of the original Viking sheep that were brought there when Iceland was colonised. So they are literally just the sheep version of Icelandic people. Yeah, yeah. And and to be honest, most of the population of Iceland is actually as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> they're extremely hardy. Um they're kind of honestly it sounds like they're kind of feral like they're apparently aggressive towards other kinds of sheep <laughs> they kind of just like like to be so on their what own you're saying is Icelandic sheep are racist I mean I didn't say that <laughs> but, but it could be inferred I've never seen them around other sheep you know <laughs> from me to slander the good name of, of a sheep <laughs> <laughs> they are they're related they're related um to the shetland and that they're both d- descended from um from old kind of norse varieties of sheep and i did talk about shetland sorry i said i just said makes sense yeah um, and I did talk about Shetland quite a bit a couple of episodes ago, so I'm not going to go into that too much here. But um, the Icelandic sheep, are, although they're actually mostly used for meat in Iceland, um, it's one of the biggest things that they export is, is sheep meat or lamb, I guess. But they're really famous for the wool because it is so warm. And, you know, there's really cool Icelandic jumpers, like the colour work ones um they're they're just oh like the ones in the crime dramas is it that kind of thing yeah yeah (laughs) um they're they're so warm because these sheep just have to live in really harsh conditions and they've got this really downy underlayer of wool and then like a coarser more hard wearing outside that's a very long staple like a husky oh is that what huskies have Mm-hmm. They have like the fluffy layer and then the like hair layer. Oh, Icelandic sheep are the huskies of sheep, confirmed. Nice. They're they're quite prized among spinners and knitters for the quality of their wool, which is I mean it's quite coarse, but for outerwear it's amazing because it's just so mm. warm. Um so yeah, that's the Icelandic sheep. And if we take a short little hop across the sea to the Shetland Isles, you get the Shetland sheep, um, which similarly, very old breed, thought to originate from the Vikings. Um, and that is kind of acclimatised to the Shetland Islands and has um, a, a wool that's a lot softer. And is really famous for having a long, very long staple, which is the length of the individual fibres of the wool. And so it can be used to make this amazing stuff like Shetland Lace, which we did a whole episode on. Um, yeah, listen to episode two if you, ha- if you want to know more about Shetland Lace. Yeah, do that. It's cool. Um, yeah, so that, that's a couple of Northern European breeds. Um, I'm going to go a bit more down into England now um, and talk about the Herdwick, which is really interesting because... I think, I think I've had that. I think I've had Herdwick lamb. Ooh. I think that's a thing. Okay. Yeah, there, um, there's not so many of them around now. They've kind of fallen out of fashion a bit because their wool isn't very soft. Um, and I think I mean I don't know too much about the economics of sheep raising (laughs) but I did read a fantastic book by a Herdwick Shepherd in the Lake District called James Rebanks Um, I think it's called 
the shepherd's year or something like that hold on oh yeah it's called the shepherd's life the shepherd's life yeah um yeah it's a really good book about raising sheep in the lake district uh, in today's economy um and so the herdwick sheep um they're quite an old breed i'm not sure exactly how old they are but they're a good few hundred years old and they live up on the fells in the lake district and they get hefted to a particular patch of ground which means they like that's their home they live there when you say hefted Mm -hmm. i'm just imagining people like carrying sheep to us to the right field now (laughs) i like that i like that image please tell me that's what it is don't think it is (laughs) um it kind of just means that they won't, they won't wander away. You can literally just take them up there in the spring and leave them there and then come back later and all of your sheep are still there. Oh, okay, so are they the ones that you'd, if you go to the Lake District, you just see a herd of sheep unattended in the middle of nowhere? Is that what's going on? Yeah, I would assume so, yeah. Um, apparently they bring them down in the winter um, to to, like keep them alive but for most of the year they just they just stay up there doing their thing i like it yeah it's a low maintenance sheep yeah i mean it sounds like quite a nice life just like roaming out on the fells and being a sheep i don't know i envy these sheep yeah that is it's the millennial dream isn't it oh to be a sheep (laughs) um oh and in fact i i do want to share with you um a quote that i found from well it's more actually the poem that this quote comes from at the moment i'm reading the golden thread um, by cassia sinclair which is a history of fabric and there's a chapter about the wool trade in England, which was very lucrative and one of the reasons there are so many varieties of sheep. And we should probably do a separate episode on that because there's some wild stuff involving wool with the Dutch. Oh gosh, yeah, I mean, we probably should. But there's just like so much and so many like knock on effects from it that mm. you wouldn't like expect. But, um, yeah, there's a quote from a poem written by somebody called Winrich of Treves, who in 1090 writes a poem called The Conflict of Sheep and Flax, which is from the perspective of a sheep. Excellent. It's just about different sheep sort of extolling the praises of dyes from different areas. <laughs> it's adorable. I like the idea that a sheep is picky about what is used on its wool. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's talking about madder being used for red dye in, in Britain. Um, and it says, not blood, not sun, not fire, glows as red as you, Britain, ruby in my coat. Oh, sorry, Mr. Sheep. So that was a fun one. Unfortunately, I can't find like a translation of it anywhere because it's written in Latin. Because obviously, that's what sheep speak. Um, well, obviously, because they are God's creatures. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that um, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. <laughs> I think Nick study um, Latin. We should send this poem to them. Yeah, can you get Nick to just walk out into a field and start shouting Latin at some sheep <laughs> <laughs> and film it and put it on the Patreon? <laughs> Maybe once we're allowed in fields again, that could be quite fun. Yeah, that's that's one to practice. And you know. <laughs> so, what did you do in quarantine? 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, what what, do, what is in this poem that you mentioned? Oh, that was just, yeah, that's the quote from it that I wanted to oh, mention. okay. I just, I just liked that there was a medieval poem um, from the perspective of sheep. It is very good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, another sheep, uh, the Wensleydale. I love the Wensleydale. That's the one with the dreadlocks, right? It is, yeah. Wensleydale, um, also known for cheese, cheese grommet. Yes, it's it's the cheese that Wallace from Wallace and Gromit mentions a lot. Which is, it's kind of a slightly creamy, slightly nutty one, which it's you, you get you get nuttiness a lot with with sheep cheeses. You can get one with cranberry in it, Wensleydale with cranberry. It's like... I haven't had that. I've had Wensleydale with apricot in. Ooh, which is a very nice like yeah. for for a pudding, a little dessert yeah. cheese. Okay. Uh, anyway, sidetracked by cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I just love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the Wensleydale is quite, quite characteristic. It's um, a, one of the younger breeds, heritage breeds, um, that I'm going to talk about. But uh, when I say that, I mean it's early 19th century. Ugh, what a young whippersnapper! Can I ask what is the like cutoff for what is considered a heritage sheep? I don't know. Um, I would assume it's a sheep breed that is from before industrialization. Okay, that that tracks. Like, so this is like right on the cusp of heritage, then. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, and it's they are still they're coming back. They're getting quite popular, mainly for the quality of their wool, which is they're a long wool breed. So I'm also going to find a picture of these because that's why really they get dreadlocks because it's just so long. Yeah, it's really long, really lustrous wool. It's almost like shiny. I've spun with it, and it's just absolutely beautiful. It's it's got this luster to it, and almost like a kind of fuzzy halo around it. Um, and when you see the sheep, they, they do kind of look a bit like they have dreadlocks. They've got these really long, beautiful locks of wool that are really kind of um, curly. And they have a bit of an emo fringe going on. <laughs> oh, they, they really do. They've got this characteristic forelock that's called a topping, apparently. Um, but it just, it looks very emo. It's like the icing. <laughs> Oh, the sheep. Um, yeah, but they um, they did decline. Like a lot of the heritage breeds, they declined in popularity with uh, industrialization, and with that came um, less variety, um, and also wool from the nineteenth century industrial. I guess the second industrial revolution, um, more cotton was kind of being produced than wool in the mills. Um, so wool production kind of took a bit of a back seat and that continued into the 20th century. Um, but then a lot of these are getting more popular again because now we like their variety. Like we want to have different kinds of wool and mm -hmm. especially like spinners and crafty people and stuff. Yeah, there's like, been a definite craft resurgence. Yeah. Um, and that's been really good for like yeah, appreciation of the heritage breeds of sheep, um, and which a lot of them are perfectly adapted to the environment that they're native to. So it's really good to have all these different breeds um, because they're often quite involved in the management of the landscape. Like, for example, the South Down sheep, um, which is native to the South Downs, which is where I'm from. And they're adorable. They've got these kind of really fluffy teddy bear faces. And they're used for managing the downland, uh, which chalk downland is actually more diverse in terms of plant plant species per square meter than the Amazon rainforest, which is like a wild fact. <laughs> um, and the chalk grassland is managed with the sheep grazing 
Um, so like if the sheep weren't there, then the chalk grassland would kind of gradually get taken over by trees and scrub. So yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's like, I mean, I could go on. There's a lot. <laughs> And um, there's definitely more in other parts of the world as well. Um, well, yeah, which... I mean, you've done your local sheep. There is a, a Lancastrian sheep breed known as the Lonk. What? L-O-N-K. The Lonk. <laughs> that is a good name. <laughs> I know nothing about them beyond the name and the fact that they're meant to have been bred by monks. Monk Lonk. But they're called Lonks. <laughs> That's a good name. That reminds me as well. There was another one when I was trying to pick what breeds to talk about. Uh, there's like a Romanian breed of sheep called the Wallachenschaft. Oh. Really it sounds like a sword. It kind of does. <laughs> and this is Wallachenschaft. Your sword? No. My sheep. <laughs> Pokemon sword and sheep. Oh, yeah, un unfortunately, they're endangered. There's only about well, oh, there no. were about of them, of them left um, around 2000. So, yeah, I mean, if anyone knows that, please to fi find out the fate of, of the Wallachian chef. I, I have to know. Or any information about the Lonk. <laughs> Points will be given for the most entertaining facts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, a uh, brief, wild and wonderful tour through the many breeds of sheep. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe like, I'll, we'll do some more later on. Those, those were some wonderful sheep facts. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, I feel like when that. this episode goes up, we should maybe tweet some pictures of some heritage sheep. Definitely should. And we should caption them. We should have a caption competition. <laughs> <laughs> what would the prize be? Some world's dyed wool? I mean, it could be. <laughs> you might have to wait a while for it, though. Um, well, at least three weeks. But, I mean, this episode's not going up for about three weeks. The word is fully grown in July. That's a little more than three weeks. Uh, might have to wait. I mean, I Wensleydale wool maybe. Some some or something. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash bread and thread. Patreon rewards include instructional videos, recipes and access to a Discord server where you can discuss crafts and food. I want to talk to you about the Ploughman's Lunch. Ah! You heard me mention Ploughman's Pickle last episode. We're on the Ploughman's Lunch. This oh. is great. This is great. Because this is a thing that I've just grown up with as like, this is a Ploughman's Lunch. But I have a sneaking suspicion that so it, it has secrets. So how how old do you think the Plowman's Lunch is as a concept? I mean, do you want to explain what a Plowman's Lunch is first? Um, a Plowman's Lunch is, well, now a Plowman's Lunch is you go to a pub and you ask for a Plowman's and you get some thick slices of bread, some thick slices of cheese, some pickled eggs or some Plowman's pickle, which I will explain in a not pickled eggs, some pickled onions. Please edit that. Some pickled onions um, or a plowman's pickle, which I will elaborate on in a moment. And you generally have it with a pint of beer, preferably ale. Sometimes you get apples? Yes, yeah, sometimes you get mm -hmm. apples or salad, but the, the base plowman's is bread, cheese and pickle. Yeah, Not pickles, fun. pickle. So how old do you think this concept of the Plowman's Lunch is? Okay, I mean, it, it sounds like it should be some kind of ancient, you know, like medieval peasant foods, like the Plowman mm. would go out 
in the morning and, and plough the field and then sit down for his like hearty ploughman's lunch. Is that true? I kind of want it to be true. It's half true. Okay. So the idea of a ploughman having bread, cheese and beer is mentioned in a satirical poem from 1394-ish called Pierce the Plowman's Creed. Yeah, I've heard of that one, I think. Or is that, is, is Pierce Plowman like some kind of character? No, that they're, they're, they're two that? different things. Okay. They're two different poems in the same tradition. Is oh. Pierce Plowman and Pierce the Plowman's Creed. Okay, that makes a lot the more sense. I've tried to read, couldn't get into, but it's just about this guy who has like Christian dreams. Um, whereas Pierce the Plowman's Creed, which is the one that mentions the bread, cheese, and beer, is a satirical poem about monks. Sounds great. Um, so I mean, obviously, the idea of eating bread, cheese, and beer. Like, everyone knows bread and cheese. It's in every film when someone runs away. They take some bread and some cheese. Bundle. But the the idea of selling this meal as the plowman's lunch was created by the Cheese Bureau in collaboration with the Milk Marketing Board <laughs> to try to increase cheese sales after rationing in the 50s. The what? <laughs> the Cheese oh. Bureau and the Milk Marketing Board. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> the monthly bulletin of the Brewers Society um, in 1956 um, mentioned this mission um and said that the cheese bureau quote exists for the admirable purpose of popularizing cheese and as a corollary the public house lunch of bread beer cheese and pickle this traditional combination was broken by rationing the cheese bureau hopes by demonstrating the natural affinity of the two parties to effect a remarriage <laughs> <laughs> that is that is poetry <laughs> I cannot deny the natural affinity of the two parties <laughs> the two parties being I think the cheese bureau and the brewers society oh okay I thought they were talking about bread and cheese no it's bread um, beer cheese and pickle it's four parties <laughs> in the meal <laughs> that's a lot of parties in your meal <laughs> There's a party in my mouth and all the pickles are invited. <laughs> um, so the concept of like pickled onions has been a thing pretty much forever, as we mentioned in the jam episode. Um, things, yeah, I guess would have been pretty essential. But what we know as the plowman's pickle is much more recent. Um, it was created by Branston Pickle in the 30s. That's his name. Um, its ingredients include onions, apple paste, vinegar, sugar, carrot, rutabaga, tomatoes, and dates. Okay. And the, I mean, that recipe has at least been pretty much unchanged, apart from swapping out sugar for high fructose corn syrup for the American market. But the Branston pickle in the in the UK is still made with actual sugar. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought I guess I've never really thought about Branston pickle that much. I never used to like pickle. I mean, it's it's not the brand that I tend to get, um, because Bury Market has um, they just have this really nice brand of of Plowman's pickle that I can't remember the name of right now because we haven't had any for a while. But Branston's is pretty good. Is pretty good, to be fair. Yeah, it is. Um, it does go. So, yeah, this... to... I've got to admit that. She could say they have a natural affinity. They do. The two parties. <laughs> so but, I mean, this concept of the plowman's lunch is is so ingrained 
just what 60 ish years later that you can actually buy a pl- just a plowman sandwich which is just a ham cheese and pickle sandwich because i'm not sure when the ham snuck in but ham has become like a part of it yeah it seems to be a like a some sometimes you get ham sometimes you don't but mostly mm. you get ham this this was not in the original vision of the cheese bureau or the milk marketing board i'm just saying oh is it not canon it's it's not canon ham is not canon ham only exists in fanfic plowmans <laughs> <laughs> it's apocryphal ham. <laughs> I thought it was quite nice. <laughs> so yeah, the the plowman's lunch is a delicious lie, is what oh. I've learned. That's so surprising. I like I said, it's just it's a thing. Like if you grow up in the UK, you go to the pub and there's your plowman's lunch, or there's a plowman's I mean, to be fair, like. At this point, I think it is valid to call it a thing. It's been a thing for like sixty years. Yeah, but like to know that. But they was... pretended it was a thing sixty years ago in I'm order to sell good, cheese. It's an actual conspiracy to sell <laughs> cheese. It's a cheese conspiracy. <laughs> oh. A conspiracy. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my mind's just been blown. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to suggest an episode or a local larder, you can email breadandthreadpodcast at gmail dot com or tweet at us like Andy did at Thanks. bread and thread on Twitter. Yeah, and um, we'll see you next time for some more exciting cheese fat.